In some ways, this is the same sad old story. A story of nature and its plenty brought to its knees by the greed of man. But our story is just a little different. The bison are the symbol of Manitoba. They're sacred to the Aboriginal peoples here and they are emblematic of the American West. At one time, the bison roamed these fields in the millions. And to think over the course of just 30 years, there were almost none left in the world. This is the story of the Manitobans who brought them back from the brink of extinction. My name is William Jordan, and this is Historicity. The accepted narrative is that the Americans, led by the famous Buffalo Jones, saved the bison. Perhaps not this dramatically, but nonetheless the credit is theirs alone. In fact, historicity shows that Canadians played a far more pivotal role. From the two Winnipeg brothers who captured the first bison calves, to the eccentric Manitoba prison warden who tried to tame them to one of the most powerful men in Canada who sent them around the world. These were the people who made sure the bison are still here today. We started with 18 heifers and one bull, so that boy was pretty busy his first year. Um, and we've grown it over to over 1,300, 1,400 animals now. Len Epp is the owner of the Rockwood Bison Ranch. I'm here to find out how the bison herds are doing today. Wow, they are big. Look how many there are. And just to think, there are more bison in this field than there were in the entire world at one point. That's right. There was less than 300 animals left in the world. And uh, some people thought this has to stop. Len is really passionate about his animals. In fact, he's the president of the Manitoba Bison Association. So altogether, I think we've got close to 450,000 animals in North America, which is, you know, they say if you talk to some history buffs, they keep telling us it's the best success story of a rebound by an animal anywhere in the world. We're pretty proud of that. And as a bison-loving Manitoban, we're happy to have people like you. Yeah, thank you. Bison conservation was not an issue for thousands of years. For the numerous native tribes who relied on the bison for food, clothing and shelter, they were an inexhaustible resource. Even with the arrival of horses and mass slaughter hunting techniques, they still seemed indestructible. We heard the steady tramp, tramp of their stampeding feet coming toward us. The Indians advised us to move our camp into the nearby bush. We did so, just in time. For 24 hours and more, they were coming in long, loping columns, passing at the rate of about 10 a second. I saw all around me buffaloes in every direction, as far as I could see. Charlie Alloway, Buffalo Hunter. Here on Main Street is a monument commemorating the Battle of Seven Oaks. It marks the beginning of the end of the buffalo. They were now a commodity that drove empire. Pemmican, a foodstuff made from bison, was the staple of the West and was worth fighting for. It all came to a nasty head here. It was the Pemmican War. And in this battle, 21 settlers lost their lives in a shootout with Métis buffalo hunters. It was the first of many battles to control the bison, which were now becoming a rapidly depleting resource. I conceived the idea the day was dawning that the vast herds would be depleted. I had bought 21,000 buffalo hides from a single brigade of buffalo hunters, paying $3 for the average. As there are dozens of brigades hunting at a time, it didn't take any higher mathematics to realize that this rate of killing could not go on forever. Charlie Alloway. The Buffalo Brigades had to go further and further to hunt fewer and fewer. The bison hunting life was over. Canada was in transition. Prime Minister John A. Macdonald was negotiating with the newly formed Manitoba government, led by the Métis leader, Louis Riel. 
To represent Canada's interests, the Prime Minister sent Donald Smith, president of the Hudson Bay Company, with $5,000 in his pocket to bribe Riel. If that wasn't enough, he also had an army, the Wolseley Expedition. When they were done drinking the town dry, most went home, but some stayed. Donald Smith stayed to run the government. An eccentric colonel from the Wolseley Expedition, Samuel L. Benson, stayed to run the local prison. And two Wolseley Expedition privates, Charlie and William Alloway, stayed to make their fortune. Recognizing a tremendous opportunity, the two brothers captured a couple of calves and kept them at a pen right here at Deer Lodge. In 1877, there was a pronounced shortage of buffalo and by 79, they were practically unknown in Manitoba. By the spring of 1878, our little herd had grown to 13 animals. We realized that we had something of value, although we didn't know the buffalo were practically extinct. Charlie Alloway. The brothers thought there might be more money in banks than in bison. In fact, this boarded up furniture store here on Main Street was the site of their first ever endeavor. And so, they turned to an old friend to buy the herd, their former commanding officer from the Wolseley Expedition, Colonel S. Benson. The buffalo were going to jail. Four. So we're playing golf in front of a prison because the first warden built the first golf course in Western Canada. Sounds like a pretty eccentric guy. That's right, he was. Gordon Goldsboro with the Manitoba Historical Society invited me out to what was once a golf course outside Stony Mountain Prison. It was also where Benson kept his bison. Sam Benson had come here in 1870 and Benson was a character. He was a character in a lot of different ways. He, uh, he loved wildlife. He had a menagerie of a whole series of things. He had moose, he had bears, he had badgers, he had geese. Well, he had bison as well. Why would Benson buy the bison? I think he saw bison as simply a natural addition, simply because they had been at one time numerous across the prairies. Now they're becoming a little bit more rare, and I think he thought, hey, this would be a really great addition to my, uh, to my private zoo here at uh, Stony Mountain. So the golf course was right here then? As far as we know, I mean, the boundaries are hard to tell this too far after the fact, but yeah, somewhere in the vicinity of the prison uh, was the first golf course. All right, should we take a swing then? Let's do it. The vitality of the buffalo has always been a matter of astonishment to me. The morning after Warden Bedson bought my 13 buffaloes, a cow dropped a calf. That same day, the herd was moved 22 miles by road from Deer Lodge to Stony Mountain, round by Winnipeg. The next day, they got away and came back 18 miles in a V-line to Deer Lodge, the one-day-old calf with its mother tramping through the deep snow. The third day, they were moved back to Stony Mountain, 22 miles, a total distance of 62 miles covered by a three-day-old buffalo. No domestic calf could do a quarter of that at the same age. Charlie Alloway. Wow, a nice shot, Gord. Thanks. So did Benson have the bison for long? He did, he had them for quite a few years, and they uh, were really prolific. The uh, herd grew, and uh, he tried to domesticate them. He had succeeded, for example, in hooking up a pair of moose to a, to a, 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 a sleigh. Uh, he tried that with his bison and, uh, well, it didn't go so well. He learned a lesson that virtually every modern bison rancher learns, that, that bison are wild animals and they're going to stay that way. One Christmas, Benson invited over eight guests to watch as he tried to get a bison bull named Blizzard to pull his sled. Benson's 18-year-old daughter, Minota, remembers in her diary. Christmas afternoon, father had a two-year-old bull brought out of the stables and hitched to the toboggan for the pleasure of his eight guests. Five or six prisoners held on a long rope round the buffalo's neck. He stood for a long time, 15 or 20 minutes. All of a sudden, the buffalo took a terrible jump in the air. The prisoners and guests scattered far and wide in the snow. In the spring, father got a letter from North Dakota. A buffalo with a piece of rope round his neck wandering about. Was it his? A man was sent to bring the airing home. Minota Bedson, 1880. So what happened to the bison after Bedson? 
Well, Vetson, of course, was here in Stony Mountain and the community was growing. In fact, the, the community grew kind of around his menagerie and it just didn't seem appropriate to have wild animals in a community like this one. It was kind of like a bison diaspora. Um, part of the herd was sent to Donald Smith. Donald Smith, or Lord Strathcona, had given Bedson a loan in the first place to buy the herd. And uh, so he took the bison in payment of that loan. Uh, the remainder of the herd, in fact the largest part of the herd, were sold to a guy named Buffalo Jones and were transported into the United States, eventually ending up in Texas. Buffalo Jones is one of the mighty products of our Western civilization, one that an American may be proud of. As a hunter and a sportsman, few equal and none surpass him. Theodore Roosevelt, President of the United States. Jones, famous for killing bison, now turned his head toward preserving them. Jones toured the herd all around the world, making them international stars. These bison bought from Benson would become a cornerstone of the American preservation effort. So if I understand this correctly, the Alloway bison herd was really the seed for all the bison in North America. Absolutely. What's not well known is that the herd here in Stony Mountain was the beginnings of herds all over the continent. And Manitobans like Alloway and Bedson and of course Donald Smith were essential to the story of bison conservation in North America. This is the same Donald Smith who would become one of the richest men in the world. One of the most influential Canadians of all time. The man who would drive the last railway spike in the nation's first transcontinental railway head of the HBC, MP, first Baron Lord Strathcona and Mount Royal. I am standing here at a plaque dedicated to him in between Donald and Smith, two of the three streets named after him in Winnipeg alone. But our story of Donald Smith doesn't take place here in the bustling downtown. Ours is a tale from the frontier place considered remote, downright dangerous, a place in the middle of nowhere. That's right, I'm talking about Silver Heights. Well, today allowed barbecues about as wild as it gets here in Silver Heights, but back in the day, this was the wild frontier. But it was in this unlikely place that Smith built his estate. It had an experimental farm, and most importantly, a bison enclosure. But there's one problem. Even though there's a plaque commemorating the house and enclosure, no one really knows where it was. So I went to the archives to try to get to the bottom of it. I went through files books, microfiche, whatever microfiche is, until suddenly, a breakthrough, a treasure map. Okay, so the buffalo enclosure is right here. Um, Donald A. Smith's house is uh, right about here. Is this accurate? Yeah, as far as we know. Using the crack forensic technology of Google, it seems that the manor was located down the street from the plaque at a small lot on Trail Avenue. So I enlisted a bit of help on my quest to find the real location of the Smith yeah. Estate. Well, it's like that, that seems pretty demonstrable to me. Dr. Frank Albo is an architectural historian famous for his insights into early Winnipeg. He's the protagonist of the best-selling book, The Hermetic Code. Well, it doesn't seem like much now. It's hard to imagine that this place was a buffalo enclosure. Right, I mean, for the average visitor, this looks like picturesque 1950s apple pie country. However, as you rightly noted, it was a vast expanse of the last frontier. And in fact, this entire area was a bison enclosure. <laughs> it's not really the ideal setting that you'd think of roaming bison, but there you have it. Why don't you tell us about the Donald Smith house here? Well, Smith acquired it. Uh, it was just a simple log cabin, well, somewhat palatial by uh, 19, uh, 1870 standards. Uh, but what he did was, is he converted it into a residence for even royalty. Wow. Yeah. It had an ante room, it had a dining room, and of course, the all-important washroom, plumbing, uh, was uh, essential to inviting guests, and even this served as government house. Yeah, and two lieutenant governors stayed here, I understand. Indeed. 
It is impossible to describe to you all that Donald Smith had done for our comfort. Had he been a great duke in the old country receiving the Queen, he could not have made greater exertions. Lord Dufferin, 1875. Although Lady Dufferin was not amused. A fine reception room and two ante-rooms, carpeted, papered and furnished, have been added to the house for us, which we regret, as the place is really too far away to entertain in. It is along a prairie road which is simply impassable when there's been rain. The mud here is by all accounts fearful, Lady Dufferin. So, with the help of the map and our keen navigational skills, Frank and I find the true location of the Smith Estate. With bated breath, I ring the doorbell. Hi, and who are you? This may sound strange. Frank and I tell her the tale of the unusual history behind her house. So Ella, are you the first owner of the house? I'm the only owner, the original owner on our street. And when did you acquire it? And we bought a hole in the ground in 1954. So have you ever found any bison bones in your backyard? No, and I'm looking for gold and I haven't found any yet. <laughs> you want to come in? Yeah, sure. Well, okay. Let's okay, come on in. Where's the time? It's amazing how things have changed. Ella takes us through her house before showing off her own experimental farm in her backyard. I'm really interested because it's history to me. It's history and our children go to school and we learn many things and we don't know what's in our own backyard. I, I don't think this could be a more poignant account of exactly that. From this mansion in Silver Heights, Smith was building a business empire. From steamships on the red to banks. But it was his next business venture that would ironically put the death nail in the bison just as his Silver Heights herd helped save them. Canada's first transcontinental railway. Smith's railway opened up the west. Now, no area was too remote. There was nowhere for the bison to hide. It became extermination on an industrial scale. Bison meat fed the construction of the railway. They were shot from train cars purely for sport. In the States, things were even worse. Their extermination was government policy as an attempt to control the indigenous population. By 1890, the largest prairie export was buffalo bones. Smith's final journey to Silver Heights came as a celebration after famously driving the last railway spike. Smith was known for throwing lavish parties, and this latest in Silver Heights was to be his biggest yet, with many of the world's movers and shakers in attendance. As a jolly prank for the occasion, Smith's longtime business partner, William Cornelius Van Horn had a railway crew lay a spur from the main line right to the front door at Silver Heights. Yeah, 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 here you are, man. Van Horn recalls Smith's surprised reaction. We were all engaged in conversation, and Mr. Smith apparently did not notice that the engine driver had reversed the engine. At last, he looked out the window. Why, we were backing up, he said. This is really very strange. Suddenly, the house came into view. Why, gentlemen, I must be going crazy. I've lived here many years, and I never noticed a place so like Silver Heights. Silver Heights, called the conductor. The train stopped, and some of us began to betray our enjoyment of the joke. After another glance outside, he began to laugh, too. I never saw him so delighted. William Cornelius Van Horn. The party was considered a rousing success. The one sour note came in the form of a telegram delivered that evening. Louis Riel had just been hanged in Saskatchewan. With the death of Riel, Smith's business in Manitoba was over. Smith didn't return to Silver Heights after that day. The house had accidentally burned to the ground and it saddened him too much to go back. However, the experimental farm remained and the bison herd steadily grew. They became a local attraction with tourists flocking to see the magnificent creatures. In fact, the great excitement of 1890 was a showdown between two bulls, Old Shaggy and the newcomer McCreary. The newspapers trumpeted the Buffalo Battle of Silver Heights. Winnipeggers flocked to the bison enclosure to watch the fight. The gate was thrown open 
With a low, angry bellow, the old bull walked out. Fire glinted from his eyes set deep in his shaggy mess of hair. Young McCreary never moved, but winked weakly and showed no desire to fight. Manitoba Free Press. The Silver Heights herd became so popular among locals and tourists that it was decided that they had to move. The majority ended up in a new park in Banff. There they were ruled over by Sir Donald, Smith's namesake, the most famous bison in Canadian history, the last calf caught in the wild, one of Alloway's original bison, through Benson, through Silver Heights, and into history. The remainder of the Smith herd didn't have to go as far as Alberta. They ended up right here across the river from Silver Heights at a new zoo being constructed at Assiniboine Park. Here at Assiniboine Park, the bison still attract thousands. Charmaine LaFleur is tending to the herd, featuring some new additions courtesy of Len Epps Rockwood Ranch. Hi, Charmaine. Hi, Will. Pleasure to meet you at nice last. Nice to meet you, too. So how are Len's bison doing? They're doing really, really great. Great, great. They're integrating okay? Yes, they did their 30-day quarantine when they came to the zoo. They were accepted really well. Wilma became their, kind of like their mom. <laughs> she introduced them to the other girls, introduced them to Blizzard, and it all worked out really well. Now they're one big happy group. From places like Assiniboine Park in Banff, the seed was planted for the rebirth of the great herd. Insofar as it is within the power of man, the buffalo shall not perish from the earth. Sir Wilfrid Laurier, Prime Minister of Canada. Now Prime Minister Laurier threw the weight of the Canadian government behind the conservation effort. The government decided to buy back bison that had been sold to the American Buffalo Jones. Hundreds of animals were purchased and moved by train from Montana to Buffalo National Park in Alberta. The herd that had started with Alloway's three little calves were now reunited back in their home and native land. And so this sad old story actually has a happy ending. The bison were just a heartbeat away from being the next woolly mammoth. And yet they live on, these magnificent creatures that mean so much to so many. Well, well personally, it's, it's my life. They're my living. Uh, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. But as a producer, you know, uh, when we hear the history of what, what the bison went through, we're pretty proud of ourselves bringing them back. And of course, we never started it. It was started by some pretty important people years ago, but we're trying to keep the legend going, I guess. It is very rewarding. There's a lot of personalities and they make the job really fun. I am very proud to work with them. Our children go to school and we learn many things and we don't know what's in our own backyard. Manitobans like Alloway, and Bedson and of course Donald Smith were essential to the story of bison conservation in North America. If you walk into the Manitoba Legislative Building, the two most impressive elements are the colossal bronze bison. Now, of course, they're the totem beasts of Manitoba, but they also signify something else. They ward off evil in the House of Democracy. Well, you're telling the story of how uh, our forefathers had great vision for preserving the bison after it was almost hunted to extinction. Manitoba Premier Greg Selinger is also passionate about bison conservation. Today, he announced the opening of a new provincial park. We originally introduced with Scout and First Nation 32 wood bison there. Wow. And now the herd is up to 300. Yeah, it's amazing the role that Manitobans played in the preservation of the bison and are still having today. It, it is, and uh, as you know, as you can see here, when you take a look to the left or to the right, you can see it's always played a very strong symbolic role in the province of Manitoba. When you look at the bison in the legislature here, it's a symbol of the sanctity of life. It's a symbol of abundance on the prairies. But it reminds us, uh, as a cautionary tale, that we have to be respectful of nature to ensure that the bison will continue to be an important living symbol in the history of this province.
Ken. They're dead. Oh no.